Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's virtual conversation with our guest, Jesse Thistle, brought to you by the Making the Shift in Conversation series. Making the Shift, or MTS, is a youth homelessness social innovation lab to make the shift from managing the crisis of youth homelessness to preventing and enabling sustainable exits from homelessness. MTS is funded by the Government of Canada's Networks of Centres of Excellence program. Visit our website at makingtheshift.ca for more. Our hashtag for today's event is hashtag MTS in Convo, and we'll be retweeting content from that conversation. You can also follow us at, at @homelesshub on Twitter and Facebook. So this is a listen-only webinar, so if you have any questions for our panelists, please type them into the question box in the control panel on your screen. We'll host a Q&A session at the end of today's webinar. If you experience any technical issues, send us a message through the questions box, which is also in the control panel of your screen. We'll be recording today's webinar and you will receive a follow-up email with the link. So now I'm going to hand it over to Stephen Gates, who is the president and CEO at the Canadian Observatory on Homelessness and the scientific director at Making the Shift. Okay, so I'm going to start with uh, our main guest, Jesse Thistle, Assistant Professor in Métis Studies in the Faculty of Humanities at York University. Um, Jesse is a Métis Cree from uh, Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, and um, he's, in a very short time, established himself as uh, a leading scholar and also a public intellectual. Um, Many of you will be familiar with his memoir, From the Ashes. Uh, it's a number one national bestseller, winner of the uh, 2020 Indigenous Voices Awards category of best published prose in English. Winner recently, I believe, Jesse, of the Kobo Emerging Writer Prize for Nonfiction. And it is a Canada Reads First. Jesse is uh, a historian and he is... Um, a uh, winner of, as a graduate student of the Governor General's Academic Medal in 2016, and he's a peer Elliot Trudeau Foundation Scholar and a Vanier Scholar as well. So hello, uh, Jesse. Hello, hello, Mr. Gates, Stephen. <laughs> hello, <laughs> nice to see you. Yeah, Jesse and I go back quite a while. I think you started working at the observatory when you were in high school. Yeah, basically, yeah. <laughs> it's been a number Way of back. It's been a number of years, and uh, I think um, one area where the work really took off is when we started working on the Indigenous definition of yeah. uh, homelessness in Canada. And you, I remember at the time, we're trying to figure out how are you going to pull together a definition given the complexity of, you know, um, 630 odd communities, different language groups, that kind of thing. And you really did an amazing job of uh, indigenizing the process. And I recall you came one day and said, you know, I was talking um, to uh, an elder, Jenny Blackbird, who, who said, you, you, you need to start yeah. something like this with ceremony. Yeah. And so we did that uh, up at York. And that was like really powerful. Do you recall like what happened? I do. There was the, the woodpecker that came. Yeah. She said that if we were to write the definition or supposed to, that a woodpecker would come and we were passing around the, the pipe. I think you were doing the pipe and then the woodpecker showed up right yeah. above us. So, yep. It's a true story. A moment. So that was, and then it went from there. And uh, so, but I'll leave that for you to discuss. We also have our panelist, Jane Mellenfant, PhD student at McGill University formerly a grad student at York University, I might say, um, founder of the Making Shift Scholars with Lived Experience 
network and uh, I'll talk a bit about that in a second. And she is also a, a Vanier and Trudeau scholar. So, wow, <laughs> it's making me feel a little inadequate here. But anyway, over to you, Jane. Thanks, Steve. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jane Malfont and my pronouns are they, them, or she, her. Um, so as Steve mentioned, along with Charlotte Smith, uh, I've been involved in the development of the Making the Shift Scholars with Lived Experience Network. Uh, which is made up of some like amazing students and researchers at all different points in their careers um, and work and who all have a shared experience of youth homelessness as well. Um, they're all amazing. I think a bunch of them are listening. Uh, and I've been super grateful to get to know all of them over the last few months. In February, we had our one and only in-person meeting before COVID. Um, and Jesse, your work came up, uh, has come up super often as someone who has some shared experiences um, that we've all related to. Um, and it continues to come up as something we find like super inspiring, super necessary, and informing all of our research. So I'm very excited. Um, I know also just for me, this is really exciting because I've been personally like really grateful to know both of you. I think both of you have influenced the way that my doctoral work has happened, is unfolding, and also how I feel like my experiences are valid, my research is valid. So like, I'm super thankful to know both of you and really looking forward to the conversation today. Um, I think that's it. I don't know. Yeah. Great. Well, well thank you, Jane. And I'm gonna hand it over to, to Jesse now. And I just wanna say one last thing is that I never tire of hearing Jesse speak. Um, I learn something every time. Not only is he an extremely gifted writer, uh, but his ability to communicate uh, in public settings is second to none. So fasten your seatbelts, everyone. I'm going to hand it over to Jesse now. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's been wonderful to know you both, actually. for the last, I've known you, Stephen, since uh, 2012 and Jane since 2017. Uh, yeah, it's been quite the ride. I, I don't know. How do I share my screen here? Do I just press this green screen share button does that work does everybody see my screen here can everybody see that or no yes we okay can. okay you guys can see it all right yeah so uh my name is jesse thistle i'm uh Métis Cree from Northern Saskatchewan. I'm a, a recovered scholar, now writer. No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm a, I'm a scholar of Métis history. I teach, I, I was teaching in the equity studies department at York University, but we've now moved over to humanities. Uh, so I'm teaching uh, Métis history and um, about Indigenous homelessness over in that department now. So if you're interested in hearing me speak, you can come uh, sign up for one of my classes at York. Um, what I'm going to do is walk through the definition that uh, Stephen was talking about there and uh, just go through what I actually did. And then I'm going to read a story about when I first became homeless um, back when I was 20. And I lived in a car with my buddy Leroy. It's in my book, and then we can just like open it up to the, the questions, I guess, that they had prepared. So, um, yeah, so this is about the indigenous methodology behind uh, the construction of the definition that has now gone on to change policy from what I've heard from some people. Um, and so we start with the fundamental question, why do we need a separate definition of indigenous homelessness, right? Uh, at the annual COH Executive uh, RPA, Research Priority Area Committee meeting in Montreal in 2015, of which I was the National Rep of Indigenous Homelessness, uh, I was at that meeting. Uh, while I was there, I proposed that the COH create a, a national definition of Indigenous homelessness. Uh, and this was in reaction, really. Uh, to the Canadian definition of homelessness developed by the COH in 2012 uh, that really focused on 
uh, the typology of homelessness as being without a structure of habitation. So you had unsheltered, uh, emergency sheltered, provisionally sheltered and at risk of homelessness and everything therein in between. And when I was reading through it and while I was at this meeting, I felt like it didn't really articulate what I had gone through on the streets uh, when I had first become homeless back when I was 20 and I stayed, you know, off and on until I was 32. And so I didn't really see that in this definition here. And um, yeah, I proposed it at the November 2015 meeting in Montreal. And a uh, short time afterwards, the COH accepted the idea and made plans to work towards a definition. Uh, and from the outset, um, we understood that to ar articulate Indigenous homelessness properly, we needed to empower Indigenous knowledge and define Indigenous homelessness from an Indigenous perspective. This meant working at every level with Indigenous scholars, academics, knowledge keepers, uh, oral historians, uh, service providers, community members, teachers, elders, and people with lived and living experience. Uh, I believe uh, at the outset that we needed to consult with Indigenous peoples who lived and experienced Indigenous homelessness. And this meant uh, some community members that the COH had already been working with in the field. That was how they uh, they connected me into their uh, networks. So the second step to building the definition was finding someone who knows Indigenous homelessness to lead the project. So at the first meeting, I just proposed it and nothing was really decided there. Um, the COH knew, uh, Stephen and Allison, that they wanted the project to be led by an Indigenous person with both lived experience and academic training. They also wanted that candidate to have an ongoing connection to Indigenous communities. Uh, so not just some uh, ephemeral ancestral connection through uh, anc uh, Ancestry.com, someone with living connections to Indigenous communities. And I guess they were short on, on candidates because they approached me in December of 2015. Uh, we went for coffee in, uh, I think it was moonbeams in uh, Kensington Market in downtown Toronto and they asked me there and uh, they knew of my life story obviously I've been working with them since 2012 uh, they knew of my connection to my family uh, indigenous family that are Métis and Cree and Saskatchewan as well as the Toronto community they knew that I had served on uh, I was the president of ASA, that's the Aboriginal Students Association at York University, and that I had a really good background uh, in Indigenous history here in North America, specifically the Great Plains. Uh, and so uh, they, they approached me and I agreed. I agreed. I don't think I agreed right in the meeting. I think I did afterwards. Uh, and part of uh, me agreeing was that we rooted uh, this project in Indigenous ceremony. So we, we privilege uh, Indigenous epistemologies and worldviews over Western knowledge and how we do that from the literature and the stuff that I was reading. Uh, you have to start with ceremony and let that guide. Uh, and so that's what we did. I believe strongly that it was the only way that we could make the project legitimate in my eyes in the eyes of uh, the Indigenous community and in the eyes of spirit. You know, a lot of like uh, when we talk about research, especially around Indigenous people here, the, uh, the saying research is ceremony. Well, this is, we, we literally built this project off that one, uh, that one saying. And uh, once we established that, I told Steve and Allison that we had to privilege Indigenous ways of knowing and that we had to keep all levels of consultation Indigenous. So we start really strong in an Indigenous way and some projects that I've been on in the past before this, they kind of lose steam 
and that co consultation all the way up kind of falls away. But this one, I wanted it to be the, all levels of consultation to be done in an Indigenous way. And Stephen and Allison were very keen and uh, they already wanted to make it happen. They were kind of just shopping around for the right person. And they found me and uh, they soon gave me the green light to start the project. And uh, that threw everything open. Um, so the next thing that we're, I was, op I started with Stephen. Um, it, when you start a project uh, with an indigenous methodology, they, they say it's in Anishinaabe Moan, they would say it's in a good way. We're starting the project in a good way. Naheo or Michif people would say something similar. I don't know my language. I'm disconnected as a child. So I would know how to say in a good way otherwise. Um, but really, when we started the, this whole project, I realized that I had to look at the literature of more senior Indigenous scholars who understood Indigenous methodologies far greater than me. So I looked at Maori, Linda Smith, Suzanne Strega, uh, Michif Professor Chris Anderson, and uh, Jeannie O'Brien at the University of uh, Minnesota. And uh, these Indigenous scholars stated that ethically-minded, Indigenous-led research projects always ground its research in indi Indigenous cosmology and ceremony, and thus proceed in a good way. A good way meaning beneficial and serving the needs of Indigenous peoples themselves. This meant that I first had to enter into ceremony and ask Creator if I or the COH was supposed to do this work. An elder at York told me that the answers I was speaking, looking for would be there in the ceremony, but be prepared to hear that uh, me or Stephen or Allison or anyone at the COH might not be the right people to be embarking on this work. And if that was the case, uh, the elder said that we should stop pursuing the project there. Uh, and this was like no, January 2016, I would, I would imagine, yeah. Um, she next advised uh, that I needed to seek out someone that was from my own territory uh, as a knowledge keeper and elder. I'm from Saskatchewan, I'm from Treaty 6, and so I had to find a Cree or an Aheo, a knowledge keeper. And I was already working with a woman named Jenny Blackbird, who does a lot of work with homelessness and addiction in uh, the Toronto area as well. as She's like an auntie to a lot of people. And so I approached Jenny and she felt comfortable helping me in this way on this project because she's actually uh, worked with my brother, Jerry, who uh, still suffers bouts of homelessness uh, now. And so she came on the project and we started working together. And uh, she advised that me and Steve uh, go into the pipe ceremony to start the work and that she would know then if the COH or I was destined to write the definition or even if it was needed, even if it was needed. We were going from the assumption that we were proposing something and really ready to dial it back anytime any community member said not to do it. Uh, so we didn't hear anything back from the community on February 22nd, 2016. We entered into the pipe ceremony at the Sacred Fire, so that's the teepee, uh, at York University behind Osgood Hall at the end of the university. Uh, Blackbird opened with a prayer drum song and she put tobacco down, Sima you know, is what we call it, and asked for creator or spirit uh, and the ancestors to guide our work. And as she was doing this, Jenny said that the woodpecker, her, her spirit helper might appear. And if it did, it would be a really good sign like me and Steve opened with at the beginning there. No sooner did she finish and Steve passed the pipe off to the, to, to the left to Jenny, did the woodpecker literally show up above his head. And we all understood that we were meant to do this work. That was the sign that we needed to continue in a good way. Um, Blackbird closed the pipe ceremony by saying that the definition is representative of bringing fire. 
meaning it will illuminate the issue of indigenous homelessness and create bonds of kinship across the country. And that it has the power to bring our relatives back into the warmth of the fire. So number four, <clears throat> no need to invent the wheel. Two groundbreaking Australian reports, the 1998 Keyes Young report and the 2003 Ohuri report, situated Aboriginal homelessness in broader British colonialism. And when I use the word Aboriginal, this is, uh, this is what they call their Indigenous people in uh, Australia and uh, New Zealand. Uh, they, they still use that term. We don't hear in Canada, and just so people are aware. These are my words, this is what they're saying. Both of these reports, which centered Indigenous perspectives, found that Aboriginal people through colonial projects had been dispossessed, marginalized, and discriminated against by government, settlers, and projects of assimilation. And that was what had driven Aboriginal homelessness. Moreover, they found that the Aboriginal concept of homeless, a collective feeling of rootlessness, did not fit Western standard ideas of homelessness or without a structure of habitation. A 2015 Homeward Trust and Blue Quills document also articulated urban Indigenous homelessness on the prairies provided um, and it, they, they articulated it from an Indigenous perspective and again found that we needed to look deeper at Indigenous homelessness, be that urban or rural uh, Indigenous homelessness, because it wasn't just about having, not having a house to live in. And the last theoretical piece uh, of the definition comes from a Métis Cree woman who, f who used to feed Winnipeg's homeless out of her own pocket. Uh, that's this woman here, Althea Gabas, my sister, uh, or some may know her by her famous name, the Bannock Lady. Uh, after suffering a bout of homelessness in 2011, she went to a place called Bannock Point uh, in Manitoba, is a very sacred uh, site, to visit the indigenous petroforms and ask the ancestors there for her purpose in life. There she received a vision from spirit to feed Winnipeg's homeless. After, um, as Al uh, Althea understood it, she was to give uh, homeless in Winnipeg a semblance of a healthy community. She was to be their relative and restore the indigenous village that colonialism had deeply undermined. Althea's vision and her actions every day under understands intuitively that indigenous homelessness is about being without healthy, loving, social relations, or as the definition artic articulates it, is about being outside the relationship web of all my relations. When I asked Althea to help me develop the definition back in March 2016, it was then that she told me that she also had been visited by a woodpecker. She told me this without knowing that our team had been also visited by one two weeks prior. Althea and I knew then that spirit had bound us together to write the definition. Uh, and it was the, th it was the theory uh, laid out by these landmark documents and Althea's work. Uh, this represents the spine or the base structure upon which the definition of indigenous homelessness is built. So number, number five, the fifth part of this lecture is about uh, Indigenous-led consultation. The National Steering Committee. First Nations, Inuit, Métis uh, populations all across Canada are vast and diverse. Uh, from the north, south, east, west, rural, rural, urban, from all geographies all across the country. Uh, from the outset, we tried to consult with all of these people. In January 2016, we put a call out for 10 National Steering Committee members. The National Steering Committee members, NSC, was comprised of Indigenous scholars, academics, and frontline workers who work with Indigenous homelessness or who have experienced homelessness. And these connections, these initial 10, came from 
uh, the, the homeless hub and their work that they've been doing out in the field for years. Uh, so they plugged me into their network. Steering committee members work with me to brainstorm, edit, and provide suggestions on early draft definitions. Between January and September 2016, the NSC developed 16 core drafts, and this represented uh, the skeletal structure of the definition erected upon the theoretical spine of the other documents. Uh, the other uh, NSC members are from varied, various organizations such as the School of Social Work at Ryerson University, the Department of Political Science at the University of Lethbridge, the Department of Applied Psychology and Human Development at U of T, York University, uh, the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation, and on and on. Beyond the, the NSC, there were two more levels of consultation. They were the Regional Advisors Committee, or RAC, of 50. Some of the agencies involved in the RAC were the TDSB, the Métis Nation of Ontario, Aboriginal Legal Services, Native Men's Residence, Homeward Trust, Friendship Centres, Concordia University, Hamilton Regional Indian Centre, Griffin Centre, West Neighbourhoods House, University of Saskatchewan, Trauma and Outreach and Community Supports for Manitoba Families, Gott Bannock, and many, many more. The RAC, uh, really that's the thickest level of the consultation, they really did the bulk of the, the fleshing out or the building out of the body of the work. Between October 2016 and July 2017, they helped create 23 additional drafts for a grand total of 39 drafts. And it was like herding cats sometimes, I tell you. Surprisingly, the, the 50 voices of consultation and the literature were generally saying the same thing, but in their own unique Indigenous nationhood and voice, of course. That Indigenous homelessness is a result of colonial interruptions over time that work to erode healthy relationships within Indigenous communities. The last stage of consultation was the National Elders Council. We were aiming for 10, but we only got six. It's really, really hard to find good elders. And these were elders that were selected from across the country uh, from uh, recommendations from the NAC and the RAC, or NSC, sorry. Uh, these uh, elders represented uh, the traditional knowledge keepers and they had to be consulted with to legitimize the work. Uh, the NEC had final authority over the definition, uh, and I remember sending the definition to them, thinking that if they kibosh it, you know, there goes a, an, a year and a half of work uh, that we put in collectively. Uh, but once the 39th draft was produced and finalized by the RAC, I kicked it up to the NAC, uh, the elders read the definition and it took them about two weeks uh, and they agreed with what we had produced and in August 2017 gave us the green light. They believed what the NSC and RAC had written and what I wrote captured the complexity of Indigenous homelessness as, they, as they'd seen it in their long lives. Okay, and the next uh, bit here is about design. So I think it's just a beautiful document too. It's not only really good to read, it's nice to look at. And so I remember talking with Allison at, uh, at the Homeless Hub and really thinking, working with her and trying to get like the good, the proper uh, Indigenous designer. Uh, we had all agreed that we needed to keep this final leg of uh, production uh, Indigenous led. Uh, and so with Allison's uh, blessing, uh, we put out a, a call out over the, the Homeless Hub for an Indigenous designer in August of 2017 uh, uh, to design the definition. And in September, we got a, a few bites and we hired Jocelyn Frank. Uh, she's a member of the Métis Nation of Alberta. Jocelyn worked closely with me to develop the graphics, colors, 
and layout of the definition. And it was important to keep the design team Indigenous as Jocelyn's vision uh, for the circle of all my relations, the color scheme, and the graphics needed to portray the definition from an Indigenous perspective. And so I couldn't really coach uh, Jocelyn. She came up with a lot of this on her own. Uh, what she produced, in my opinion, uh, articulates what the NSC, RAC, and the elders envisioned. Uh, the colors of the design implicitly depict the medicine wheel. Uh, the circle of all my relations is done with sweet grass, fireweed, and the mayflower. And the, the fireweed represents uh, indigenous people because we're uh, fireweeds indigenous to the whole of North America and used by all uh, different indigenous peoples. And the mayflower obviously is uh, settlers coming uh, into the circle of all my relations. And these were uh, used to depict uh, Indigenous and non-Indigenous relations here on Turtle Island. And the 12 dimensions, as you see before you, are really about uh, the articulation of those disconnection of those healthy relations over time. So you hear, I'll, I'll just go through a couple of them so you have an understanding of what I'm talking about. Historic displacement. This is really about like Indigenous peoples losing their connection, their systems of knowledge, there are ways that they understand themselves in the world. Uh, it's about their disconnection from their territory and land, right? Uh, and you really got to think like back in the day, uh, the land was like uh, the perpetual university for Indigenous people. Uh, and we trained in them since we were kids. And so when we were pushed off our lands onto reserve lands or lost our lands through scrip or Inuit relocations, along with it went all these systems of knowledge, the way that we understood ourselves in the world and there was a complete disorientation. So that happened historically, right? With treaties and, and uh, reserves, but it also happened contemporarily, like what's happening with Wet'suwet'en uh, territory, ultimately that, that pipeline's making people homeless, indigenous peoples homeless, because it could potentially ruin their homeland. Muskrat Falls in Labrador, same thing. The floodgates that happen every year in uh, Manitoba, uh, in Dolphin, that makes people homeless. So that, that's what I'm talking about. Next is a disconnection from our worldviews, actually. So when you lose a connection to land, uh, you also lose uh, how you see yourself in the world and your relationship to Creator. And that's a, a spiritual disconnection because you stop seeing yourself as part of this whole all my relations and it's in many cases was replaced by judeo-christian worldview where everything's hierarchical and so that disconnection itself i theorize is a kind of homelessness and so do other people like paul mamot in australia that's where i got that uh, spiritual disconnection uh, from uh, cultural dis, uh, disintegration and losses like a, a loss of language loss of uh, connection to family and kinship. All these things come when you lose your, uh, your culture. Uh, and we have very st uh, strong examples of uh, policy where this was a directed effort by the state to affect linguicide, uh, epistemological side, I think it's called. I heard uh, Dr. Alex uh, talk about that last week in another lecture, as well as um, domicide. The destruction of our how we lived in extended families that was replaced uh, later on with uh, nuclear uh, faulty nuclear uh, family constructions uh, of, of of homes and that's led to things like overcrowding and that's I can get into complexities with qu uh, questions but I really just wanted to show you the process and then the last bit on uh, uh, the definition of indigenous the methodology behind it was returning to Bannock Point. So when I launched it in 2017 in October, the day before I got on stage at the Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness, I went with Althea to Bannock Point. This was the place where she got her message uh, from Creator that she was to feed uh, Winnipeg's homeless from her own pocket. And uh, yeah, we went there. Uh, we placed tobacco down and we thanked um, whatever forces uh, for the wisdom uh, and the ancestors for helping us uh, throughout the, the crafting of the definition 
And uh, we also asked that it would go on to help other homeless people, not just indigenous people, uh, these newer understandings of homelessness as a disconnection from social relations, we thought would work well with other marginalized populations like elders and veterans and women and stuff like that. So what we, me and Althea were doing really when we went back and put the tobacco down is we we're closing the circle. We were come full circle in our Wakudawan, she's Métis Cree as well, and we acknowledged its power according to our ways of knowing. And uh, yeah, um, that the next day I unveiled it in front of uh, a couple thousand people. Uh, Jenny Blackbird, we flew her out. She was the, the elder and she gave a birthing song actually of the definition when it, right before it was unveiled. And this was our way of birthing the knowledge that we were just stewards of and letting it live in the world and do the, its, its work like a child would, right? We were like parents and letting our, our baby go into the world. And uh, what a blackbird has told me is that the window, the song that she sang created a window for spirit uh, to go back uh, as well as birth the knowledge. Uh, and in doing so that uh, she closed the circle, she brought the ancestors home. And uh, now the definition's out there, it's living and apparently it's, it's caused, uh, you know, quite a bit of positive change from what I've been told. Uh, I get emails every once in a while of uh, new places like uh, the city of Ottawa is using it and uh, places out in Vancouver, I mean, uh, Alberta and whatnot. So it's, it's, it, it is living, it is doing the change that we envisioned. Uh, and then the second half of this is really, because uh, this was like a joint kind of uh, lecture, the first little bit of my lecture is really about uh, the work that I did at the COH when I was there. Uh, and then this is more about when I become homeless for the first time, when I was a young youth, right? Because we're talking about youth homelessness. Um, the name of this talk is uh, They Were Your Elders, and it's done more in a, a literary realism narrative type of way instead of this rolling lecture type of way. So you're going to notice I switch gears here. I remember sleeping in my buddy's car alongside the banks of the Fraser River in New Westminster in British Columbia. The two of us had been there for a few months in winter 1997. Winter in Vancouver, despite what people think, can be quite cold and damp. I slept in the back seat, he stayed in the front. My time in the car are some of the worst and best memories of my life. I hope my little story today will shed some light on why that is. I was raised in Brampton by my white, quote unquote, grandparents after my Métis Cree family in Saskatchewan couldn't raise me and my brothers. And growing up without any sense of myself as an Indigenous person led to some pretty poor choices by the time I was 20. I was wild. I partied all the time. One day my grandparents had had enough and they kicked me out. Then they banned me from ever going back home. I thought Vancouver would be a great place to start over, away from my addictions and the damage that I caused everyone. So off I ran like the coward I was. Little did I know that Vancouver is the epicenter of street life in Canada. It can be argued that it's the most dangerous place in North America if you're native, addicted, and lost. Within weeks of living in that car, I wasted down to nothing. I was six foot two, 130 pounds, and was a walking skeleton. I didn't know anything, you know, where to get food, shower, ask for help, social services, and I couldn't shoplift because I looked like a street person and floor walkers always followed me wherever I went. But the chill in my bones was the worst. At night, while trying to sleep, my back and legs ached from the cold and the condensation of our breath. I was folded up like an accordion across the back seat. 
my feet rammed into the side window trying to stretch out. Sometimes my face would press against the door handle and I'd wake up with a circle on my cheek or my forehead. The imprint usually remained there for days. Other times I wouldn't sleep at all. I'd just lay there with my eyes open, shivering and wondering why God, Creator, Allah, the universe, whatever you want to call it, had abandoned me. I remember wishing I could go home, but I just couldn't. The only good thing was the back window of the car. It was like my television. I'd watch every night as the clouds rolled by, blotting out Grandmother Moon as she smiled down on me from her place high in the sky. The constellation of stars, too, seemed to twinkle and wink at me as they glowed bright in their millions. And the comets raced by, waving at me, then falling off one by one in the direction of the Pacific Ocean. Those frigid nights seemed to last forever in the back seat. And as I watched the celestial heavens in all their glory, I prayed. I prayed for our home, for a future, and for the light of day. Without fail, the sun would crest over the eastern mountaintops right when it was coldest, right when I couldn't take it anymore, right when all hope of warmth seemed lost. And when those morning rays hit my face and warmed my spirit, I knew I'd earned the daylight. I knew I'd earned the right to live. I knew I'd earned my tiny spot in creation. I'll never forget how triumphant that felt. I doubt I ever will. Years later, after I'd gotten sober off the streets and found my way to university, I met a Métis Cree elder. I'll never forget what she told me in her kitchen one day. As I sat there complaining to her about my time in the car in the river, the pain, the coldness, the bent bones, and the heartbreak, I just blathered on. I knew she'd had a similar story of homelessness in her youth, and I thought maybe we could connect that way, you know, build a bond, you know, about bitching about the hardships of street life. Halfway through my story, she stopped me. How dare you? She said, as she put her tea down and looked me right in the eye. She was quite upset. How dare you talk about your elders that way? I was confused. She just let me sit there for a few minutes, let it percolate in my little pea brain, you know, like elders do. But I couldn't figure it out. Finally, she said, Don't you see, Jesse? Addictions, homelessness, loneliness, loss of identity. Those were your real elders. They taught you how important love is, how important family are how important food and shelter are. And you got to see the stars and moon in ways that most today will never take the time to see them in all their splendor and beauty. But beyond that, your elders taught you the value of sunlight and that each day is a blessing. And they gave you a real sense of belonging within creation. Those, my child, are priceless lessons. With these last words, my elder changed my perspective from resentful to thankful. She got me to see that sometimes we go through rough times to learn valuable teachings so we can go on and share them with others, just as I have done with you all today with my life story and the definition. It is my hope that I've helped some of you see that my time in the car it wasn't all bad. It was just the path that I had to walk so I could learn and eventually help my people in the work that I do today. And it is my hope that you will see the light as I see it. A gift, a promise, a daily affirmation that we all have a purpose and a right to exist, either bathing together in the glory of the morning sunlight or stargazing alone at the back window of an old car 
under the watchful eye of Grandmother Moon. Thank you very much. I feel like now I have a billion other questions that I want to ask you. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I always enjoy listening to you speak to you in every sense. Um, I think when you're talking about like the idea of dialing back research, if it's not serving the folks you're working with, like this idea to me, it seems so foreign in academia. Um, and I think for some of us, uh, it can be really alienating to see research talk about our experiences and those of our family and friends um, and see how abstracted it gets when those connections are such an important part for research for me. So I was going to ask if you had any experience or strategies reconciling those tensions in your own work um, and how you can maintain relationships and connections with like actual people. Uh, within your approaches to research. I know you talked about it a bit in your methodologies, but um, yeah, it's something I struggle with, so. Yeah, that's a great question. So I read an article by Eve Tuck uh, that talks about like uh, researching uh, in an ethical way in indigenous communities and part of her research or their research, sorry, uh, was that uh, you should change the material circumstances of those you work with. So uh, what, what is your research actually doing? Is this for like career advancement or is it to like change things? Is it to affect uh, change in the life of the people that you're working with? And so I learned early on, especially in my work in Métis home, uh, um, history, that my work as a, a carpenter actually serves me well. So I work with a lot of elders and I'll build stuff for them uh, in exchange for them helping me on my projects. And so it's like quid pro quo, we work together that way. Uh, I don't try to include people in my research that are really, really vulnerable. So like people that are actively in, um, you know, staying at a shelter or whatever, unless I have an ethical clearance, I won't, I usually don't work with them. Um, yeah, those are a couple of the things that I have done over the years. Um, yeah, and I always make sure that I check with uh, Indigenous uh, gatekeepers, like Althea was kind of that for me in, in uh, Winnipeg. And I also worked with SHIP in uh, Saskatoon, and uh, they were that there in that community. So I try to find them and work with them as well, you know. Thank you. Jane, do you want to ask another question? I mean, you can ask a question. I don't have to ask all of the questions. Well, you can ask, uh, why don't you go for a couple, right? Uh, ask another one and then uh, I'll dive in. Yeah, sure. I think the other thing that I always am curious about, um, because whenever, anytime I go to a lecture, anytime I go to a classroom, um, since your book came out, people bring it up. Um, I think people have never had to think about homelessness, have never had to think about colonialism, have never had to think about poverty. Mm -hmm. Um, have read your book and are talking about it in ways that they never have. Um, so I wonder also is, can you talk about like why you chose to share in the way that you did and even sharing today, I think sometimes when we share pieces of our past, it can be intrusive and it can be violent. Um, but I also think it's really important to be doing so. Yeah. Do you have thoughts on why and how you, you share these things? Yeah, originally I, I wrote the book, I was asked by Simon and Schuster. So it was like, I wasn't really pursuing. I was uh, writing a book. I was more just trying to get my, my uh, education. Uh, and so, but I'd always been writing down my life story, little bits of it uh, all along. Uh, it started way back in rehab, uh, just me trying to figure out my addiction, uh, writing my fourth step, my AA. I went through an AA program and I continued that all the way through. And I even wrote some stories for the Homeless Hub, uh, Hail Mary Pass, which is, uh, it's been changed. It's in my book, but it's in a book that I did uh, with the Homeless Hub. Other articles that I published with other people and I collected them all and I shared them. And now, like beyond, I guess, the initial being asked, I, re I always have to remember that I'm sharing to educate people, I think, uh, because if I think about my life becoming entertainment mm. and bordering on like trauma porn and all this stuff, then it gets into really dangerous territory that's really unhealthy for everybody that's ingesting it. 
not me, not, not just me, the creator, but also the people that are consuming it. There, there's a measure of sickness with that. So I always remember that my life is an expression of trauma, which is true. But alongside my other work, my scholarship, it illuminates the stuff that I've already been doing. Like if you look at the definition of Indigenous homelessness and then picked up my book, you could actually see the individual domains appear in my book as they're articulated in the, de in the, the book itself. And so I always have to remember that because uh, if you're doing it to entertain, then it can consume you and destroy you. Yeah. And, it can, and, you know, I've heard of other people that have done that before and it's just not a healthy place. It's not constructive. And uh, I always have to be, anybody who shares their lived experience has to be cognizant of that and, uh, you know, yeah. and need support while they're writing about it. So. For sure. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Jane. And thanks, Jesse. Um, I, given that this event is being hosted by the LiveX uh, group, uh, so these are uh, early career scholars, um, who have lived experience and are likewise trying to juggle the inherent value of their experience, bringing that to bear in the scholarship. Um, can you talk about both why that experience is valuable, but also how you balance the, the, the tensions or challenges that may come with that sharing? Sure. Um, you know, like I don't get asked to explain to my past, um, and yet there's almost like an extra pressure on people, I think, with lived experience, but it's also an opportunity. I don't want to paint it as like a, yeah. a bad thing, but just that balance. Yeah, yeah, it, that's a really important balance too. Like there are people with lived experience who are, they're brought in you know, and they're put on like every grant and, and it legitimizes, right? When you have someone with lived experience and that's, that's what the, the funders are looking for. And it, the pressure like that becomes even more so when it's, uh, when you're indigenous with lived experience, you're asking, you know, you're to be on everything. And so I always ask myself when I'm, when I'm brought into one of these pro projects, can I help? Do I know what they're actually talking about and will my knowledge be impactful will i bring stuff and so like what's happening with me now i i was asked to work in the covid shelters and i'm gonna try and do that uh as a consult but the homeless world that i was in is now 14 15 years gone mm. i don't even understand this homeless world now there wasn't fentanyl there wasn't covid there wasn't these hospitals. And so I've more and more, I say, you know, I might have all this experience that I've done all these big projects, but maybe what this pro new project needs is a new scholar, a new voice, mm -hmm. someone with lived and living experience, right? They're closer to the issues. They'll know how the systems are working and failing a lot better than I will. Some of my research and knowledge is good still, but it's so far away. It's, it's like when you're um, a scholar and you have to keep up with the, 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 the literature year after year. Well, if you're not out there, uh, you know, in the systems of homelessness, then you really, you get farther and you don't know, uh, you don't know what's going on. And I, I talked about this with Eric Weissman. He's another guy with lived experience and we've talked extensively about how it's a different world, man, different world than it was back then. So. Mm -hmm. Well, wow, very, that's, that's very interesting perspective and it makes a lot of sense. Um, how does that reflection shape how, how you think about the research you want to do going forward? Do you uh, want to continue doing research? And I'm not saying that like your, your work as a historian isn't uh, about just, you know, doesn't just focus on homelessness, but is, do you want to continue in that space as a researcher or do you want to move to something else or both? It's funny. Like I remember sitting in the homeless hub and wanting to be a historian. And like, I, that was one of, one of the things that I said to myself when I left, I'm going to go and be, 
a Métis historian and I went and I did a bunch of articles and not one time was I cited in any of those articles. So nobody reads the history I produce. People <laughs> read the, the homeless scholarship I produce and when I talk about my life story, the whole country listens. And so my impact is greater the closer I get to my own personal narrative. And like the stuff that I'm really objective, you know, trained scholarly, my history, nobody really cares about it. So I have to do this weird balancing act of exposing a portion of myself, but not too much as to make myself not the expert, you know, or the entertainment, so. You know, Jesse, uh, you know, you're where I'm, I'm older than you, like by yeah. <laughs> a year or two. But, <laughs> but the thing, you know, to, in terms of your, your other work, there's quite a lag time before you start to see lots of citations. Uh, you know, if we were to have this conversation in 10 years, it might look very different. And so, um, you know, like, so you, uh, with patience, you'll see that the work you're doing, like you're a really good scholar, that, that work's gonna matter as well, I, I predict. Well, thank you, that, that's comforting. <laughs> Nobody cites oh. me either, Jesse. I know. <laughs> it's so bad. Not yet. <laughs> All in good time. Academia is very slow, as you know. Yeah. So, great. Um, do you have another question, uh, Jane? Oh, you can go for it. Um, no, I, I, I want to have you have another opportunity, and then we can see if, sure. if other people... Uh, uh, have some questions that they might want to share as well. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, something that I always want to ask you, Jesse, I think as someone who like, I can see doing this work and, and find it validating my own work, um, I guess, how do you carve out space within a, a space like academia that can be really violent and awful for a lot of people who have historically been excluded? How, like, do you find space to bring more people in like knowing how I never thought I'd go to university um, now if I'm working with youth I really want to open those spaces up for them if they want to join um, is that work that you will be doing I have been doing are already doing yeah I, I, I watch for young indigenous folks that come into my classrooms that are in many ways as dislocated as I was when I first met Steve and Allison. So I didn't know where I belonged in the world or, or who I was. And th that's a real opportunity when you catch people at that stage in their life. Right. And so mm -hmm. I always try to make special space within my classrooms. I've only taught the one year and I, I've had a couple of students like that. Um, beyond that, I always try to make sure that my, uh, when I'm, I'm creating any sort of project that I bring in someone that's a little more junior than I am. The people did that for me the whole way through uh, Stephen and uh, Allison. Uh, you know, the definition is that, right? I was totally unqualified to be writing this thing, but I did it anyway. So, uh, you know, people do that and they make space for you and they, they lift you up and that's part of, of being an academic. And so I've tried, I don't know if I've been the best uncle uh, as they would say in indigenous circles, but I, I've tried. I've tried over the years. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I, I have another question for you, Jesse. So you're, I'm interested if you can talk about the, the Métis history work you did. Uh, as part of your PhD and, and those academic articles that will eventually be cited. Uh, how did that help you with your own reconnection to your history, to your communities, to all your people? How did yeah, that it was, it was everything. So um, me and my brothers were part of a generation of uh, indigenous kids in the seventies and sixties and eighties that were, uh, I'm, I wouldn't say stolen, but lost to our home communities and were raised elsewhere. And so my addiction to, you know, what I was using uh, 
was really about me not knowing who I was, right? It was, you know, you need, your identity is a really fundamental thing because it orients you, gives you societal orientation. And so when you know who you are and you know where your family's from, you know where you're going. And so from kids like me and my brother, we didn't, brothers, we didn't have people telling us what Métis, Cree, or any of that was. We didn't even know what we were. We knew we were just quote unquote Indian. And uh, yeah, I just grew up and that made me resentful and I made poor choices uh, into addiction and homelessness and whatnot. But me getting better and really kind of lifting away a lot of those resentments that had been driving my addiction was about understanding who I was as a Métis Cree person. And I remember that when it kind of happened, Steve, you gave me an article by Peter Menzies with Allison. It was about intergenerational trauma and the effects of, of it in homeless, indigenous, urban men in Toronto. And so I read that and I'm like, oh my God, I have literally every single marker of this thing, intergenerational trauma. Uh, and so I started researching that what that was and then i started going out to saskatchewan to reconnect with my mom and her people and really understanding my people's history out there and how we were dispossessed through the northwest resistance in the late 19th century and basically the government stole our land and kicked us to the side of the road because it was war and that's what happens when you go to war and uh, we lived there in absolute poverty for a century and so I had to go back, you know, I had to go back and reconnect and meet my mom and all her family. I had to go and talk with all the elders that remembered everything. Uh, and they opened, they, they were waiting there with open arms uh, for me to reconnect with me. And so that's what my, my, uh, my master's work has been about, intergenerational trauma within the Métis. And now my PhD work is really about reconstructing uh, road allowance communities in the 20th century, all the way up until around uh, 1980 when me and my brothers and our cousins are let go into adoption. And apparently this is new research. No one's ever really studied uh, the effects of intergenerational trauma and tied it to battle trauma for Métis people. And so, you know, I had a breakthrough and nobody's cited that yet. So, but like Steve says, maybe in the future, more people will pick up that paper and cite it. I don't know. So. Yeah. That's what I do. Yeah, now. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, you've talked a lot about that work over the years and I've always found it very interesting. But the uh and your experience going back to Prince Albert and connecting and how powerful that was. Yeah. So you know, so that's interesting. The research then does kind of connect to to you um finding your identity again. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Not only my identity, it also explained a lot of the drivers of the kind of homelessness that I was experiencing. So I could see, oh, we had this historic disconnection from land when the bison were destroyed and we were pushed to the margins. I saw the contemporary geographic separation from land through our families being burnt out in the 40s and 50s. Uh, I saw a disconnection from culture when me and my brothers were taken and we lost our language, Michif, and so on and on and on and on. So not, not only did reconnecting allow me to forgive my mom and my dad, because I understood the context of their history, it also made me understand the mechanisms of Indigenous homelessness. And that, that, that's, that, that went into the, the, the definition, uh, those understandings that I heard from not only people I studied, but also other uh, people that I was working with. So that's just that's really so interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Does it become difficult to share? Like, do you get to a point where it's like, I'd rather not talk about this? Yeah, it's getting it's getting to me now. <laughs> like, I don't know. Sorry, guys. I'm just tired. <laughs> like, I'm old, man. I don't know. <laughs> It's just get, like when I was fresh, like I heard an interview from last year in the summer with Sheila Rogers. I was so, I was on. Everything I was saying was just good. I heard one the other week from like, I don't know, a community radio station. I didn't sound enthusiastic at all. So I don't know. Just wears you thin. Wears you thin. And I can't go to the spa because everything's closed. That was my way to cope before. So, yeah. I feel that. Yeah. 
I always have to remember I'm educating people. If I forget that, then it does. It's not. It's right. Not. Right. Keep that focus. Yeah. Um, Jane, you have another question. No. Well, I mean, I do, but I also think we, I mean, we have questions from folks. Oh, great. Um, okay, let's go. So I, I can always ask if we have time left, but uh, I think it'd be cool to see what people are saying. Um, so the first question is from one of the members of the Making the Shift Lived Experience Scholars Network, Linda. Um, and she said, to thank you for your honesty and courage and sharing your truth so openly in your book. I'm curious of your path in academia after your book ends. Your book left us with you in the early stages of recovery in academia. Can you expand more upon how you came to pursue graduate studies, write your book, and ultimately use your lived experience to teach and share your gifts with others in academia? So maybe what you're already talking about. Okay, yeah. So I went through school and I did really well. Uh, I didn't expect to do as well as I did. And I won all these awards. I had good people like Steve and Allison and um, my doctoral supervisor behind me early on in my undergrad. So they noticed, like, I, I don't know. What did you notice in me, Steve? I don't know. But they gave me a chance, and they started putting me in major places. So, and I did that from, like, my second year all the way through. And while I was doing that, my supervisor said, you have to publish two academic articles a year if you want to, you know, have a shot at, uh, a tenure track position because you're not going to be able to do it in your first couple of years of teaching because you're going to get slammed and that's when your clock is running your tenure track so you got to do this now so I did that all the way through so by the time I graduated I had like two or three book chapters I had like five different academic articles and then I won the Trudeau and Vanier like right back to back and so it was kind of the money of those two awards Plus knowing that like, where am I going to go? I'm 35 years old. I can't go back and work at a construction job. My body's broken. And that was like the impetus of me staying in school and going and, and finishing the rest. And while I was there, I just continued to do well. And then I was offered a job at York University in my, my third year of my PhD. And the rest is history. So, yeah. Nice. Thank you. I still think I'm going to go back to like bartending after all of this. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, Eric, who is also part of the network, um, said, uh, tell us how to bridge the definition with non-Indigenous experiences of homelessness. Well, I, I believe that the definition's assertion that homelessness is a disconnection from healthy social relations over time. I think that applies to all kinds of homelessness. It's not just for indigenous people. It might be indigenous knowledge that helped us reach that initial conclusion. And we see that it has completely different drivers that are cutting off those relationships. But the same thing can be said for youth homelessness, right? Really, it's a, a fundamental disconnection from uh, institutions, from family, from friends, and then not having the knowledge of how to transition or the financial backing to like get credit and what. And all those lead to, all those disconnections, those social disconnections lead to houselessness early on. And I'm looking at my own experiences because I just didn't know anything uh, when my grandparents kicked me out and my brother Josh. And so it was really about me being disconnected socially and then not having the knowledge of where to go to the food bank or social services or even that I could get a bus ticket to go do that. And so that's what I'm, I hope I'm articulating and showing how the, the, this concept that really I didn't come up with, this was actually thought up in Australia uh, by Paul Memot and those guys. So I just, you, I just refashioned their, their theoretical and applied it to the Canadian context. So, but it can be applied to veterans and everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. They, do, they are doing this in Finland, I think. Yeah. It's not just like housing first, it's relationships first. Mm. The second half is like full wraparound. I've been, I remember talking to Tim Rector about this, but that's what I believe is, I haven't seen the data, but I've heard that it works wherever this is. Is it Finland, Stephen, or? 
Uh, I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So. He, and it is interesting. Like, people are using different language around Housing First now because the uh, what I say is that the only performance indicator that often matters is whether the person is sheltered or not. And we need to flip that around and, and focus on well-being, mm. which includes the relations. If we take, if we did that kind of focus and talked about housing first as being a model of supports that includes housing rather than housing that comes with supports, it would change our orientation to the work. Yeah. And I think my belief is that would produce better outcomes for people. Yeah, like, see, I've been out of it for, I don't know, two years, three years. And I, there's things that are happening now that I, you know, things that probably have envisioned that are happening already. And it sounds like one of them. So. Mm -hmm. uh, we have another question um, from Sky, who is from BC and a white woman living as an uninvited guest on the unceded territory of the Coast Salish people. You outline the importance of time and space for proceeding in a good way. This often takes time and is new to so many researchers, for sure. Um, what are your thoughts on tri council slash healthcare metrics and timelines and any advice about allyship and how to do the work respectfully, genuinely, while meeting the scary pre-tenure requirements? <laughs> wow, there's a lot <laughs> there. <laughs> well, I think relationships is always the important uh, central thread. Like if you're going to work within a community, do spend the years that it takes to get in and build those connections. And sometimes they don't come, and sometimes they do. And your relationship, uh, your your research is so much richer than other people's. Like Dr. Susan Roy's research on the West Coast comes to mind, where she actually ingratiated herself within the community uh, for like ten years, and uh, that goes way beyond. Uh, the tri -ca uh, council policy, uh, so yeah. But then you gotta you gotta think about like time, right? Mm. Pre, you're talking about like pre tenure track. I don't know. I have no idea. I wish I knew the answer to that one. You know, there's a lot of people would like to know that. I'm sure. So yeah, I think time is the most important thing. That time and relationship thing, like building something for someone, seems like a very good. Uh, thing to offer for people sharing with you yeah but it takes because it takes extra time you're there for so much longer and you spend a lot more money yeah. you know going into ceremony all this stuff it costs a lot of money and so you got to pay people mm -hmm. and, yeah. Yeah. yeah funding mm -hmm. we have one more question i think um Deborah said, thank you for your touching book and talk. It has truly contributed to my journey of learning. I'm a settler working at York. I'm so concerned about supporting an emerging scholar within the academy. What has made a difference to your experience of belonging in the university and how can I walk alongside indigenous scholars who are beginning in the Western hierarchical university? Uh, what made a big difference for me was that I found my communities early. So Métis Cree, didn't know who I was, 30-something guy with a criminal record, basically. That's me at the university. And so I found out about CAS, the Center for Aboriginal Student Services at York University, early. And I went there because of my wife. Uh, and then I found, it wasn't called the Homeless Hub then, it was called something else. Um, I was referred to them by Jennifer Lennox Terrian at a University of Ottawa. She worked with, uh, I think, David French up there years ago. And so she suggested that I go in and I, I talk to people at uh, the Homeless Hub. And I, I did. I, I did that and I, I found uh, uh, Stephen uh, Allison and Cass. And those two places really gave me a sense of belonging because I was like an alien, right? I, did, I, I don't belong and feel like I don't belong in university. And so it's wonderful what you can do when you know you're, where you're from and who your community is. And so uh, that's what I did. And that's my, you know, if you're going to be a good ally, be a good wayfinder for uh, young Indigenous scholars coming in and help direct them to this, you know, sacred fire, cast, 
homeless hub wherever they need to go and uh you know kind of like a coordinator i guess mm -hmm. thank you i think that's it i was gonna check uh the facebook live to see if there was any questions unless you had some steve uh well, let's see if uh, some other questions are there you have one uh, in your pocket i think jane i mean i always, I always have questions I just, I don't, I don't want to bug Jesse too much. <laughs> I always ask weird, long, rambling questions that have. I think those uh, are my favorite. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I think like, I, we've been talking about it the whole time, this idea that like universities and academia are such toxic spaces when you're coming in, mm -hmm. like feeling as if you don't belong. I know I've talked with you about this, Jesse, um, like just, waiting for someone to find out that I'm not supposed to be here, um, even with my funding. Like, and I think this is something with the network of lived experience scholars is something we talk about often. Um, so I think like what needs to change in these spaces, like if we're having like a pie in the sky kind of ideal, what would be something that would actually shift university cultures to support people who've experienced homelessness and indigenous scholars to work in the way that they want to? I think the me metrics around testing and what we gauge is like a, a skill that um, we're marking for, right? So a lot of what we mark for is uh, memorization and, you know, some basic analysis. And I know because I have to as a professor, that's what we're, mm -hmm. but we're, we're missing a lot of skill sets that people with lived experience bring to the table. Some are geniuses at bureaucratic navigation. You know, they'd be great at like filling in Conquer for like uh, as an oh. RA, you know, they know how to do that stuff where other people, normal people don't learn how to do that. And that's a matter of survival for them. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think if we could build some sort of metrics that would gauge the ability to learn to learn, because like a lot of people says, what puts you, you know, what made you so much different than everybody else? And I said, well, on the streets, you have to adapt and you have to learn to learn or you just don't survive. Mm. And so if I've made it this far, I have at least that skill. And I think that my doctoral supervisor realized that very early on with me and she marked and built assignments that way. that gave me confidence over time. And so I think that it's a, it's a teaching problem. You know, we're not, we're not marking and measuring uh, those like really, really valuable skill sets that people with lived experience have. For sure. I well agree. Said. Yeah. Uh, there's one more question. Eric asked where you got your cool hat. I got it from you, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't no, there be I got, I, looks in it if Eric gave it to you? No. Yeah. No, this comes from Niagara-on-the-Lake. There's an Irish store there. It's got really authentic Irish stuff. Like, really, it's, it's good. You should go check it out if you're interested. <laughs> there we go. Well, that's, that's great. Um, the, you know, Jesse, this has been like a wonderful evening. And, and thank you for taking time out of your obviously very busy schedule to just share your experiences. And, and in particular connect those experiences to those of the lived experience group uh, with making the shift uh, and others. Uh, it's valuable, important knowledge um, and it's so appreciated by us. So, so thank you very much. Well, thank you. I feel like you're my father in a lot of ways. So thank you, dad. <laughs> bring, him, bring him into the academic world and teaching me you know, thank you jane i always loved our i love our conversation that we had in uh, st john's and when you're coming in so yeah thank you so much and thank you to everybody for joining us today justin we really appreciate your time and uh, i'm sure the audience has loved all of the conversation that we've had today. And thank you, Jane and Steve, for your time as well. Uh, so everyone at Making the Shift is so appreciative of this. And everyone in the audience, thank you for joining us as well. We will be sending the recording to everybody who was registered and we'll share it on our social media as well. 
And today's event was the first of our new virtual event series. So if you have any feedback on our event today, we would love to hear from you in our post event survey that we will share in the, uh, the chat very soon. Uh, and if you'd like to learn about making the shift or uh, the incredible work that Jesse has worked on with the Indigenous definition of homelessness in Canada, uh, visit makingtheshiftinc.ca uh, uh, or uh, the homelesshub.ca as well. All right, and uh, we'll say one final goodbye to our guests. So thank you again so much, Jesse, Jane. And Steve. Thank, you. thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you.